I'm going to try and address uh, a grand challenge from the consumer's point of view, really, which is the the customer and thinking about this um, as a as a retailer. Hopefully, some of that will resonate with each of you. And I'll come back to the grand challenge that most of our customers face every day, which is how's what's the best way to feed the family. So. That leaves me thinking about a case, making a case at least for um, affordability, sustainability and health, because that's what our customers are asking for increasingly. Um, Colin's short intro, I'll just make a slightly longer version. I have 30 years of food manufacturer, five years as the nation's food regulator running the Food Standards Agency, and then I've had five years at Tesco and now an advisor to, to Tesco PLC, which is shorthand for Dave Lewis and one or two of his colleagues. Um, we, between us, I think, have spent many years thinking about these issues, and I thought I'd share with you with the approach that we're currently taking. The challenge itself, what's the problem we're trying to solve, um, it's pretty well documented. So massive uh, shift in population dynamics, more strain on the Earth's resources than ever before. And as that population is becoming more affluent, and we see this in all of our markets, consumption patterns are changing. Um, we've seen migration forced and involuntary, and we've seen that swell our cities and diminish the small scale farming community around the globe. I was with the World Farming Organization yesterday and their perspective on our problems is somewhat different to that that you'd see in the UK. Culturally, as we become more comfortable as people, as citizens of the world, we have a greater expectation that food, clothes and other products are more cheaply available. The key to, I think, our understanding of what we should be doing about all of this is um, the, the question at the heart of, of our work, and that is, what's the, a good diet for the 21st century? And every one of those words is, is relevant. We know that what needs to be done is that we have to reconnect consumption with production. Um, and both of those have got to be recalibrated individually to deliver what most people define as sustainability. So this slide here, I've nicked from Tim Lang, and uh, he gave me permission to do it. Um, it, I think, summarizes very nicely what the, the challenges are, those six headings, uh, which are intent to bring clarity, simplicity, and order. Um, and of course, he would say to me, if he was on my shoulder, don't forget the interconnectivities, don't forget the complexities of those individual elements. And we don't, but at the same time, we're making policy for uh, the near future. The second theme, of course, is that consumption patterns, as I've mentioned right at the top of the talk, are changing with increased affluence. So here I'm talking, again, more globally. And what, what do we do if more and more people want to aspire to a Western-style diet? Um, that's something that we know empirically affects our health, but also the environment. And as we eat more and more animal protein, we need more and more animals to be reared for um, meat and for dairy. That requires a huge input on land and water. Not to mention, again, the, the, the thoughts that others have, have given you, which is carbon dioxide and methane emissions that result from that growth. So Tesco are definitely not experts in this, but WWF have done a lot of thinking about how to move to a more sustainable diet. And they would hold agriculture responsible for about 20% 20 20 of all CO2 emissions globally, and that makes a significant uh, contribution to climate change. And uh, this is the one that really gets me every time. 60% of the decline in biodiversity can be put down to the agricultural impact that we as humans have had on the planet. WWF then developed something you'll probably be familiar with, a live well plate, which is a diet that, that both culturally and um, it becomes acceptable to, to 
the normal population, um, and it's environmentally sustainable to produce, but nobody's actually turned that yet into something that we could all retail. But by doing that, they reckon we could save the emissions, the carbon emissions, by about 25%. So there are interesting ways of looking at this, and that means we as, as kind of policy makers within retail and food service need to be thinking about that pretty hard. The UK diet contribution to health issues specifically, um, what I often do when I'm talking to groups is, is kind of reference what my dad's generation's school photograph would look like. Lots of gangly youths in their 16s, 17s, 18s, very few if any um, larger kids and then think about mine where there might have been one or two and then think about my kids who were in their 30s and what some of their peer group looked like and then now what the school photographs look like now you, that is a, is a kind of chilling kind of indictment and my daughter who's a GP not very far away from here has to deal with the consequences of those numbers of people who are clinically uh, overweight and obese so massive growth in those numbers as we're as we're going at the same time and uh, Helen and others have referenced this about a third of all the food that's produced in the globe is wasted. And um, just to bring it a bit closer to home, at Tesco we talk a lot about availability. Any other retailers in the room do the same thing. And it, it means that customers can always buy what they want. And the shelves are full. Our Western consumer culture now requires that. But in our lifetimes, that's become normal from being slightly strange. Food would not have been perceived as fresh in the 70s and 80s if it was always there. But we've changed to that. The environmental impact of food waste is enormous. Um, food loss and waste is, is accountable for about 8% of all greenhouse gas emissions around the world. So not only if we didn't have food waste, would we, could we feed the population? We could also cut down on emissions. This brings me to the central theme of what we are trying to do, and that is that tackling food waste, tackling health, tackling affordability are not just the right thing to do. There are going to be economic benefits, but we mostly do this for the moral imperative. And you've only got to see photographs like that to know that signing up to Champions 12.3, which is what many of us have done, um, the 12.3 development goal on food waste is an imperative. So if I take these themes of sustainability, affordability and health, the key challenges are clear. If you want to produce affordable, sustainable, healthy food, it has to be in a way that's beneficial to all the people working in the supply chain. And we, all of us, need to think about our individual roles and responsibilities. And whatever our role in the supply chain, having those and adapting to these trends means that we'll all have to behave somewhat differently and influence change wherever we can on government and on others. But back to my own recent history, what's the role of the retailer? The simplest level, what we do is we meet our shareholders' objectives by buying, moving, and selling stuff. That's what we do. And if we don't get it right, um, we're challenged by our customers, but most of the time we do, so we have to do that by putting customers at the heart of our decision-making. Um, we have to understand in all of that our supplier partners' businesses, the parameters within which they work, so we can all work together to off offer the best products at the right prices. We also have to understand our customers. You would have heard many retailers say that. What are their wants, needs, and concerns? And so that brings me to a central point, which is that there isn't any point stocking products that we think are sustainable and healthy if the customer doesn't want them. We found that the best approach to that is to ask a simple question. Um, and we ask this of our suppliers. What, is, what if it were true that we were one entity uh, rather than two or three or four? What if we were a single entity and we want those economic entities to, to do the best thing for customers? What different choices and decisions would we make? And in doing that, you break down a number of barriers. Morally, as I said, we think this is the right thing to do. And nine times out of 10, there is going to be a business case for just that. Um, but 
let's just remind ourselves again that if customers are not happy with the quality of our products, they will go somewhere else. So all of our best intentions would be lost. But we've seen that the cost of inaction is immense. The true cost of food waste is look something like this. And I, I, I don't hesitate to talk about food waste as a sort of surrogate for sustainability. Um, as individual businesses, we come to the conclusion that it's not just the cost of disposing the waste of our stores, it's what we've also paid for buying it, transporting it, and storing it. So it's as much of our interests as it could be that we use as much of the crop as we possibly can. So you'll have seen, if you're uh, familiar with the Tesco ranges that we've, we've launched in 2016 and continue to sell very successfully, perfectly imperfect products which allow us to sell produce that wouldn't normally have met our specification and at a lower price. So that means we're now taking 95% of, of our suppliers strawberries, 97% of our British apple growers fruit, and that's up from about 90%. So big changes. And introducing lots of frozen products that only exist because otherwise the food would go to waste. Customers recognize this. They know that retailers are doing what they can, but they're, they're interested in both quality and saving money. So they're likely to spend more of their shopping basket in the stores that get this right. When we talk to the IGD, when we talk to our own suppliers, when we talk to anybody who wants to listen, um, there is a business case for tackling food waste. And this is a WRI number, which basically says, and it was in dollars when it was first done, that in this super competitive world that we all live in, um, if you invest a dollar or a pound in reducing food waste, the number suggests you're going to get 14 times that back if you're a retailer. It's six times that if it's for a, a food service operator and about six times again for any other catering operation. So this is globally um, and it, you know, the imperative is there. Why would you not do this if A, it isn't the right thing to do and B, it has those financial benefits? Since I first started developing these thoughts with, with our colleagues at Tesco, 25 of Tesco's largest suppliers are now joined to this task and have signed in 12.3, and our branded suppliers have just been asked the same question, and I'd be amazed if they don't join in as well. So the bigger problem then, healthy, sustainable, and affordable, at first we we really struggled, and if some of you don't struggle with linking these three together, then tell me how you did it, because we, we really found it difficult to articulate an underlying and unifying thought. First thing we do, listen to customers, second to our suppliers and other stakeholders. Um, what we asked our, uh, our respondents effectively was, tell us what you want, and they want us to make their lives easier, but they don't want us to tell them what to do. So you can see the dilemma. They don't want us to overreach. They don't want us to get involved in aspects of their lives that they feel are their business. So there isn't one amazing change. There isn't that kind of re simple remedy. So you'll, you may have seen this, lots of little helps coming through from lots of different areas from Tesco, but all adding up to hopefully a big difference. And that plan that you will see brought to life in our advertising and in stores is people, products, and places. Very straightforward, building on programs that have so far made a big contribution. The ultimate goal, though, is to move towards a future that has got these three elements to it. And that's my simple message, having something, a future where the diet is affordable, healthy, and sustainable. And that's why we're making all of those changes. When customers are thinking about health, they particularly don't want um, to be preached at. They do want to be helped. They do want to have barriers that they see to healthy choices removed as much as they possibly can. And that means that we have to re remove as, as many of the barriers as, as we can at the same time as we're producing food which is both wholesome, good quality and at the right price. So the grand challenge of all this is actually the affordability. And um, 
it's a fundamental lens that any retailer, uh, let alone one in the UK, in this competitive market, must approach any customer. And that said, customers are very clear about what they want. They, they view health as being something they aspire to, but they don't think that the cost and that their access to it is sufficiently good. So during our campaigns, which you might have seen in store in May and uh, earlier this year, we've seen price cuts on fruit and veg, put fruit and veg right at the center. We've had healthy swaps that allow people to compare the popular products that they used to buy with the products that might be healthier for them, allowing a swap. And we've, we've utilised more of the farm brand type thinking to produce, with our supplier base, specifications so that those products are at the right sort of prices. Good for customers, uh, good for suppliers who are guaranteed to sell more of the crop for long-term ordering and for less waste. And it's obviously good for business because two-thirds of our customers bought into this whole concept. On the healthy story, so this is the, the part that's been around longest. And you know, my time at the FSA, my time running Arla and other businesses, we know what those barriers are. Time, taste, and confusion. Those are the things that people say they're most worried about. So the Tesco response to that you'll probably have seen was free fruit for kids. Because um, 10% of children in the UK, um, or boys, 7% of girls actually get their five a day. Um, so to encourage kids to consume fruit, we've been giving away free fruit in our stores. So a simple initiative turned into a programme, and to date we've given away 50 million pieces of fruit. Incredibly positive feedback from parents, and you know why wouldn't you do that if that's what helped? There's been a reformulation um, revolution in that a lot less sugar, a lot less fat, um, and a lot less calories generally, but customers don't want us to limit their choice and or compromise on taste. So working on soft drinks, that, that gave us a clue. You can do this and, and customers actually prefer the product. Then for example, as we did, the, um, the Tesco shopper now, if they consume only Tesco and brand drinks, doesn't have to pay any of the sugar tax and hasn't had to for nearly two years. 36% reduction in those products alone, um, and that's just by focusing. Concentrate on what it is that would work for customers. Back to sustainability. So this is something that our customers intuitively know. They know when something is being done in the right way. They trust us. Uh, they expect that they might get an endorsement from somebody like the Red Tractor Scheme. But concentrating on our own operations and on those of our suppliers, we've been able to work through how we build a more sustainable supply base. The first of those, and um, Tom Hind was in the room, I think he's gone now, but Tom, when he was at Tesco uh, rather than at HDB, helped us develop the, the sustainable farming groups for a number of different commodities, foodstuffs, 10 of them now. And that brings together individual farmers to align them with a common approach to things that matter to customers and matter to us, so welfare, um, the impact on the planet, and so on. Long-term contracts, very important, and translating into kind of great products and great prices for customers. That way of building partnerships, though, means that you can't simply rely on what it is that the experts say, but you do have to work in partnership with them. So we, we work with experts, we're working with charities, with other suppliers and other businesses to make sure that we build partnerships that actually make a difference to those affordable, healthy and sustainable uh, components of our, of our offer. One of the things that is a bit awe-inspiring when you first joined Tesco, and in fact it's blood, downright bloody terrifying, is the number of people whose lives we influence. And if you can look at this slide just quickly, 79 million shopping trips a week, um, and something like 5 million visits to our website. We reckon that, broadly speaking, 
um, everybody in the UK uh, is connected to Tesco for about a quarter of the population. So it's typically 23% of people in the UK have got a connection slightly indirectly maybe but that's not a shoppers it's they know suppliers or they work for suppliers and it's that it's that connection that means that we don't just think about customers we think about that reach and what we can possibly do so 300,000 employees is kind of a bit of the tip of the, <laughs> the iceberg we do think that it's necessary though to build out the partnerships. If we want affordable, healthy, sustainable food for our children and to stop my daughter as a GP in Hounslow having to see so many people whose lives have been negatively impacted by the consequences of their food choices, then we do have to make a significant series of changes. Um, we are not at all arrogant or complacent about this. It relies on everybody in the whole of the supply chain working together in a way that, that it, that's the grand challenge for us. How do I feed my kids good, healthy, affordable and sustainable food? Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. We have time for one or two quick questions. This is an improvement. When I first started working for Tesco, people would actively <laughs> boo when we got up on stage. <laughs> Politely. Deborah? Hello. Um, yes, yeah, very interesting talk. I just wondered where, as a retailer, you see the balance between, obviously, the very important challenges you've identified in the, the nation's health in uh, improving that between... the industry and the government? Yeah. Um, let me be candid. I, I think as an organisation of our scale with the sort of reach I describe, um, we're impatient for things to be done to make the sort of changes that are needed. And I'll give you one very up-to-date example. We haven't talked today about the sustainability impact of plastics, and that's something that I also work on with Tesco. Um, what we're doing there is we're reducing the number of materials that our suppliers would be able to use so that we could have an entirely closed loop system for all of our food business. So if you imagine three substrates, that's all, that our suppliers would be able to use, each one of those would only be possible to be in a closed loop. What does that depend on? It depends on government moving a lot quicker than it has so far and coming up with an infrastructure at the local and national level to recover and recycle those materials. So if we have any frustration at all, apart from the distraction that is Brexit, which affects all of us, um, it is that organisations like Tesco, like Unilever, like ABF, tend to work at a different timescale and with a different set of pace than, than government does. And I can say that as an ex-civil servant. I was a terrible civil servant because I wanted everything at the pace that commercially is needed. 